want this or to do this. Talk about cannabis and mental health. So really a couple of major reviews in the last handful of years. This is the most recent one. The primary author is Black. This was in Lancet Psychiatry. And they're talking about using cannabinoids to treat these psychiatric conditions. So we're also going to talk in, in the next handful of slides about cannabis use. So regular recreational use, how does it impact various psychiatric disorders? But this has to do with treatment. And so the slide is, is a great illustration, I think, of how the data seem to indicate mostly that using cannabis to treat psychiatric conditions, not a good idea, which isn't a surprise, really. Uh, but that's what they said in a couple of papers. But I also think it's important to say, look here, look at this paper that just came out last year, too, that says these medicines given as adjunct to uh, you know, treatment as usual, essentially, were associated with some improvements. So with cannabis research, you're not going to have you know, every single paper say one thing, right? as we're learning, and depending on how people do their analyses, et cetera, or they bring their biases in, who knows? But most of the papers seem to suggest, as we would expect, cannabis is not good to treat these conditions, but not all. Not at all. And, and I always will say that when you think about these papers, you check them out yourself, right? Don't rely upon me or somebody else to tell you what to think about them. You know, check them out yourself and see what you think. So we'll look at depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety, PTSD, etc. Cannabis use, how does it affect it? Simply put, cannabis use increases the likelihood of developing a depressive disorder and it exacerbates an existing depressive disorder. And then this slide, just put in you know, some extra uh, bullets on some of these slides, again, looking at treating, using cannabis to treat, because people feel like you can use medical cannabis to treat these issues. So increased likelihood of disorder, worsening depression, uh, or exacerbates existing depression, and then if you use cannabis, there's no, no interventional studies uh, in that way. Bipolar disorder, if you, you know, if you uh, have bipolar disorder, you're more likely to have cannabis use disorder. So folks with lifetime bipolar disorder have a higher rate of cannabis use disorder. People with bipolar disorder use more cannabis more frequently, and then cannabis can worsen existing bipolar disorder. Not a surprise, I mean, that echoes mood disorder. The anxiety disorder is slightly different. So for cannabis use, there's no increased incidence of anxiety disorders, except for panic disorder, which is sort of an outlier. Again, we really don't know why that is at this point, but it doesn't appear that cannabis use will cause anxiety disorders. It does appear that it will exacerbate existing disorders, and so anxiety is one of the reasons people say they use cannabis. And so we'll have a discussion with them about if you're anxious and you use, anxiety goes down, I understand that, but as cannabis wears off, your anxiety goes back up. Over time, your baseline level of anxiety will increase. So my message is using whole plant cannabis to treat anxiety, not a good idea. However, you know, we talked about cannabidiol. It seems like cannabidiol may have some promise there. So you always want to be clear about these things. No interventional studies as well. So anxiety is a little different than mood disorders. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder, staying in the anxiety spectrum is a really nice paper by Meg Haney. Uh, from Columbia and Ian Evans at MGH, where they talk about how cannabidiol has some promise, perhaps, and I, I had agreed with that <laughs> before. And so there's at least one RCT of whole plant cannabis for PTSD, no data published yet. An observational study looking at some vets with PTSD showed cannabis worsens symptoms of PTSD. So overall, the majority of the data seem to indicate that not good for PTSD, moving to ADHD. So um, cannabis use is high in folks with ADHD, more likely, you know, if you have ADHD, you're more likely to use cannabis. Uh, and then flip side, thinking about cannabis use disorder, it, it's a, it commonly travels together. So people with cannabis use disorder. And that's what we'll often see when we're treating these patients is that cannabis use in a problematic way that borders on cannabis use disorder or meets criteria of cannabis use disorder. It's not occurring in a vacuum, right? There are other issues that need to be treated. And so that's one of my pet peeves is, you know, we'll get patients, and I think we had one yesterday, where various clinics don't want to take these patients, though they're specialty clinics. They specialize in treating, you know, a certain thing, 
and they also have the cannabis problem. So now you're not going to treat that person. Like, so it, it kind of speaks to, you know, we're, we're moving away from that in randomized controlled trials, right? People are talking about real world trials. If you're very, very fine tune, you know, if you fine tune the, the uh, you know, the criteria for getting into a study, if you do that too much, you're not going to get the patients that are really out there. Similarly, you know, if, if you have patients who have co-occurring disorders and you're not willing to treat them, I mean, I think it, it's a problem. So we treat everybody, you know, we take everybody. And so, um, you know, we're, we may treat in my clinic, you know, we'll treat somebody who has, you know, alcohol use disorder in remission. I mean, they haven't had a drink in a long time, but they've got bipolar disorder and they're on lithium and other places won't take that patient. So we'll take them. But I just think that we need to recognize the fact that people have more than one disorder oftentimes. And if you're a psychiatrist, you know, I, I don't look at borderline personality disorder as my forte, but I have plenty of patients with borderline personality disorder, right? It's not that I don't, you know, it's, I'm willing to treat that. And you should be willing to call somebody if you need help and you, you have a question, et cetera. But I think it's a problem that uh, over the years, substance use disorders haven't been as welcome in various mm -hmm. treatment settings. So ADHD, cannabis use, doesn't appear to affect the, the ADHD-related alterations in imaging studies. Uh, if you're using cannabis and you have ADHD, higher addiction severity, and then as you can imagine, it looks like worse outcomes if you're using cannabis when you have ADHD. I mean, that stands to reason. I mean, they, they travel together, right? People will say cannabis slows things down for them, and they like it. So just one quick word about treatment, and we'll wrap it up. So, um, you know, treatment for cannabis use disorder. I'm sorry, but we cover for Q and A. We cover until uh, eleven fifteen. Okay, so we got. So we're doing well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we'll take all the questions you got. So just when you think about treatment here for cannabis use disorder, I think it's important to kind of think about what it looks like, and so and, and also to try to educate people about what it looks like beyond other clinicians. So you're not going to go away somewhere for treatment, usually for cannabis use disorder. The bulk of it is going to be outpatient based. So if somebody's using cannabis in a problematic way and it's really, really bad, yeah, we'll send them to a partial program, maybe a residential program, but for the most part not. So maybe a partial program, so that's typically five days a week, five, six hours at a time, or an intensive outpatient program, three days a week, three hours at a time usually. Um, so we'll do that in the early going. Once they have that initial period of stabilization, hopefully establish some early abstinence, then we'll start working with them on an outpatient basis. But in the early going, you know, when we're talking about making a diagnosis or, you know, we're talking about in a school setting or something like that, we just want the person to be able to talk to somebody, right? So I mentioned earlier that I will go into schools and I recognize that when I'm speaking to a group, I want them to have some familiarity, to gain some familiarity with the, with the data, you know, studies talking about the impact of cannabis upon the developing brain. But I also want to, to you know, I, I understand that that's not really the, me the main message of a talk like that. To me, the main message is somebody at your school, your, your nurse, your, you, know, you may have a substance use coalition, et cetera, somebody thought that this was so important that they brought somebody like me in. And so that way, you know, we establish that cannabis is a problem potentially for some people, and that you might want to need, you, know, you might need help for that. So that way, beyond talking about the facts and the science, a, a, a student may feel more comfortable to say, well, you know, I know that so and so felt that this was important, and so in two weeks or two months, you know, I can go to that person and talk to them. So we're kind of facilitating. Uh, more so than thinking of these things as a one-off, right? We're trying to create uh, an environment where people understand that, you know, we, we know that some, you know, a subset of people may have problems and this is what treatment will look like. So we're just trying to get people into that. In the early going, when I initially see a patient or they're doing an initial evaluation somewhere, you have to understand as well that most people don't want to do what I think they should do, at least right away. So. Almost every day I'm sitting with people, talking to them, their addiction could be alcohol, opioids, cannabis, whatever, or other things. And, and so my initial recommendation often is some type of treatment, right? By virtue of you being here, you probably crossed the threshold, you need some type of treatment. 
patients don't want to do that I mean, it's overwhelming nobody wants to have to go to a program five days a week or take a medicine etc but I want to do other things in that initial assessment as well right so we're trying to get them to think about what treatment will look like have them understand why they might want treatment right doing motivational interviewing perhaps and so when I think about motivational interviewing I'm thinking about what is the one reason one reason that they might want to change their behavior that they've taken to as a coping strategy over a period of years because their one reason is better than 10 that I could give them um, but if I do a couple of things in an initial session number one show them that I care about what happens to them by how I'm listening in a way that is probably unusual you know it's hard these days when people are so busy but also by asking the right kinds of questions kind of letting them know hey I know a few things about this so if you do those things you may get to the end of the appointment with the patient and their parents let's say and they still don't want to do what you think they should do you know, they may want something else or they may think some you know a particular medicine is going to help them and you don't think it's a good idea but if you've done the other pieces in your initial assessment you know if you've done some motivational interviewing if you've been able to establish an alliance in some way the, the good news is that while they may not want to do what you think they should do and most patients don't frankly at least right away when they decide to do that down the road you know they're going to call you back because you did you know you did what you could to try to build that alliance the hope is that they do that before they lose everything right they lose their college career or they lose their opportunity to play in the sectionals or they lose the privilege of driving a car or something like that so there's a lot to do in those initial assessments when you're you know talking about treatment almost all of it is going to be outpatient moving forward and it's hard i mean it's hard to do that and you know, we could talk a little bit if you're interested about what treatment looks like in terms of behavioral interventions or medications but as i alluded to before with the annals paper really aren't a consensus pharmacotherapies for cannabis use disorder so to summarize and then we'll take some questions the landscape is rapidly changing so I think it's critical to know where things stand today when you're talking with patients or you're talking to other people who are interested in policy etc so know where things are today know it well but also recognize that it's changing it's going to be changing hopefully things will change a lot in terms of some of these treatments for example policy and interest outpacing the science uh, I told you why that is I mean there are barriers in terms of the research it's hard to do research with a schedule one substance but not impossible I think the, the funding is a larger issue having uh, people who are profiting from cannabis having them contribute to the evidence base has not occurred very much and then again an important message as always treatment for substance use disorders no matter how bad it may seem it definitely can work you see this every day and I talk about this when we have a number of patients who uh, whether it's opioids and multiple overdoses etc you know we've had them do well they're stable they haven't used and, and same for alcohol folks with cannabis use disorder be able to salvage marriages and careers and things like that and so in that it's important to know that that's a that's a fraction of our patients we've got plenty of patients who are we're battling with right now you know we're trying to help them they may be inpatient somewhere etc so a lot of people are struggling but we do have people who do well and I like to you know as part of my team meetings that you know that we have we have a team meeting every Thursday and we talk about where we are with all the patients in the hospital and patients that we're, we're struggling with etc but we also want to talk about patients who are doing well and at least one every meeting because to me it really is gratifying and it, it provides a lot of motivation you know we know that treatment can work and I think that a lot of people out there really don't understand that concept they only hear about the overdose so they only hear about bad things that happen when somebody with mental illness does something etc so they don't really appreciate this idea that if people get the right help at the right time it can work no matter how bad it may seem 